our sermon series, The Kingdom is Here. That was so appropriate to that song we sang earlier, As in Heaven. The Kingdom is Here. We're going to continue on with this series. And today's lesson, or I should say message, is from Acts chapter 4. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 4. And we're going to read verses 1 to 22. It says, Now as they spoke to the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. However, many of those who heard the word believed. And the number of the men came to be about 5,000. Now it came to pass on the next day that the rulers, elders, and scribes, as well as Annas, the high priest, Caiaphas, John the Alexander, as many as were of the family of the high priest, were gathered together at Jerusalem. And when they had set them in the midst, they asked, By what power? Or by what name have you done this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said, The rulers of the people and elders of Israel, If we this day are judged for a good deed done in a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead by him, this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained, they marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them. That from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old in whom this miracle of healing had been performed. I need your indulgence for the name, for the uh, title of this sermon. The title of this sermon is Go to Hell. I'm not going to repeat it. <laughs> I'll need your indulgence, but you'll see where I'm coming from in just a moment. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for this word. We pray that you will bless it. We pray, Father, that you'll put a fresh anointing over this. Open up our eyes, Father, to see how it applies to us. Anoint the ears, anoint the tongue of the messenger, and may your will be done. In everything that is said. Giving you the glory and the honor. In Jesus name. Amen. There's a true story. Of a southern church. That had been stressing the importance of witnessing to the people. One particularly slow young man in the congregation took the idea to heart. But he wasn't quite sure how to do it. Then that Sunday, a skeptic 
visited the church and the boy approached him and asked if he wanted to become a Christian. The man looked coldly at him and said, no, I have no intention of becoming a Christian. The young man was quiet for a moment, then responded, well, then you can go to hell. And he turned and walked away. The starkness of the boy's sincerity and the bluntness shook the man. And ultimately, he turned his life over to Jesus. You can go to hell. Do you suppose that young man was trying to insult the visitor? You think that's what this was about? I don't think so. I think what the young man was telling the skeptic was the truth. If the man refused to turn to Jesus, he would go to hell. Now hold that thought. I want to review the background of our story this morning. In Acts chapter 3, we read about Peter and John going to the temple to pray. We talked about this last week. But on the way, they met a lame man and they healed him. We sung the little song that goes along with that. This man was so excited about being healed that he began walking and leaping and praising God. And he also began to draw a crowd. Because everybody there knew him and they were shocked to see that he could now walk. Quite naturally, a crowd would be uh, you know, brought together. Never one to let a crowd go to waste. What did Peter do? He began to preach. He told the people that there was a reason this man could walk. And that reason was Jesus. This was Jesus, the Messiah that Israel had waited so long for, but yet they killed him. But God knew that they and their leaders had acted in ignorance. The death and the resurrection of Jesus had been prophesied thousands of years before Jesus came. But now Peter tells them they needed to repent. And he said, let your sins be blotted out. That times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Remember this? Acts 3, 19 and 20. Now do you think Peter was being mean-spirited when he said that? Was he insulting the crowd like that young boy who told the guy you can go to hell? Was he being harsh or rude to them? Of course not. No more than that slow-witted boy we talked about just a moment ago. Peter was simply telling the crowd what they needed to hear. They had crucified the Messiah. They did it in ignorance. But they had done it. And now if they continued to reject Christ, what would happen? They would go to hell. Therefore, what did they need to do? Repent. And don't do that. Don't reject Jesus anymore. If they embraced Christ, God would forgive their sins and give them what? Refreshment and peace. And that's what it was all about. Now, chapter 4, what we just read, starts out by telling this. Now, as they spoke to the, the people, the priests, the captain of the temple, and the Sadducees came upon them, being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in custody until the next day, for it was already evening. We read that in verses 1 through 3. Now, as you can imagine, Peter's sermon was not well received by those in power, especially the Sadducees. And Peter and John found themselves square behind bars. Now I'm pretty sure that was not the plan when they went to the temple that morning. And the next day they were dragged before the Sanhedrin. What was the Sanhedrin? It was the ruling body of the Jews. And what were they asked in Acts 4, 7? By what power or in whose name did you do this? In other words, who gave you the right to go preaching like that? Now, it helps to understand 
what got the whole ball rolling. Did you notice I emphasized the word Sadducees a few moments ago when I said it? This was the primary group responsible for the rest of Peter and John. The Sadducees, along with the scribes and the Pharisees, made up the Sanhedrin. But the Sadducees controlled the Sanhedrin. They controlled it. And they were the upper class of priests at the temple. Now these Sadducees were one of the major movers and shakers in the religious world. And they were instrumental in Peter and John being arrested. There was something about what Peter and John preached that day that angered them. But what, what is it that Peter and John was preaching that could have upset these guys so much? Verse 2. Being greatly disturbed that they taught the people and preached in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. If you came to Bible study Wednesday night, you know what I'm getting ready to say. What's wrong with preaching the resurrection of the dead? Do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? Do you? Do you believe it? Uh, any, any, anybody going to nod their head? Amen. Okay. I believe it. But guess what? The Sadducees did not believe God had the power to do something like that. They were liberals of their day. They didn't believe in a real physical resurrection of the dead. And they got pretty ticked off at those who did believe it. And then as I said Wednesday night, the Sadducees didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And so they were very sad, you see. That's how you can remember them. <laughs> Which ones did not believe the ones who were sad. Sad, you see. This was what had ticked them off so much about what Peter and John was preaching. This was why they challenged Peter and John about their preaching. They despised the very idea of anyone believing that the dead would rise. So now Peter and John had been arrested for teaching this doctrine of resurrection. And Peter now has been given a chance to address the Sanhedrin. Most powerful religious group in the nation. And just like the young man who told the skeptic he was going to hell, and just like when Peter told the crowd they had crucified Jesus and needed to repent, Peter now tells the dignified ruling body of the Jews exactly what they needed to hear. What was it? Verse 8 and 9. Peter, now here's the key, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel. If we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man. By what means he has been made well. Now if that's all Peter had said. He would have probably been okay. But Peter was not the type to be shy and quiet about his commitment to Christ. Now he was before when he. When it's time for Jesus to be arrested, what did Peter do? He denied his Lord three times and he regretted that. So from there on out, he was never going to do that again. He wasn't going to be shy and quiet. He was going to say what needed to be said. And he had no intention of stopping with just beating around the bush. Peter needed to tell those people what they needed to hear. And this is what they needed to hear. Look at verses 10 to 12. Let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. Uh-oh. He's talking to the Sadducees. God raised from the dead. By him, this man stands here before you whole. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders which has become like the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. If you don't believe in Jesus, Sadducees, Pharisees, scribes, then guess what? You're going to hell. That's pretty much what he said here. Because if you're not saved, where are you going? That's where you're going, right? Peter told the Sanhedrin exactly what the crowd at the temple had heard. 
You crucified the Messiah. You rejected the one sent by God. And you need to understand that the only way you can undo what you have done is to appeal to the name of Jesus. The only name that can save you from your sins. Now these were not Peter's words. What did the scripture say? These words were inspired by who? The Holy Spirit. And it was the same message Peter repeats over and over again. He said it at Pentecost when 3,000 repented and were baptized into Christ. He said it at the temple when he healed the lame man. And now he says exactly the same thing as he's addressing the Jewish high court, the Sanhedrin. He was not being harsh or rude. He was not trying to insult them. He was telling them the gospel. They crucified Jesus. They were guilty. But they didn't have to live in that guilt. They could repent. It's the same message we needed to hear when we all became Christian. Our sins put Jesus on the cross. We were guilty. And we needed to repent and be buried in the waters of baptism and rise up to a new life. And because we needed to hear that message, do you suppose it was the same message everyone else needed to hear? Of course it was. Just so you get a grasp of how bold Peter's speech was. Imagine going to the White House and going up to President Trump and telling him that he's wrong and needs to change something. It wouldn't be a pretty sight. But I want you to notice that while the Sanhedrin did not like what Peter and John had preached, notice it didn't seem to offend them that they had said it. Look at verse 13. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, notice what it says. They marveled. And they realized that they had been with Jesus. No offense. They were kind of shocked. Like, wow. Wow. Where did they get this boldness from? Wow. Now, the sermon series that we're preaching on this month is dedicated to explaining how Jesus built his church. The series is The Kingdom is Here. And every, almost every week we talk about what was said in Matthew chapter 16. Jesus told Peter, I will build my church. And what did he say? The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And what Peter did this day in front of the Sanhedrin was exactly how Jesus intended to do that. With boldness. You see, Peter and John were bold and they were not intimidated by the Sanhedrin. They had one message. And they kept repeating that same message over and over and over again. You have sinned, you are guilty, and you need to repent and turn to Jesus. You know, there's a poem by a famous poet named Edward Guest. But most people only remember the first line. I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. You've heard that expression before? I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. That's actually a, the first line of a poem. Notice this. I'd rather one should walk with me than merely tell the way. The eye is a better pupil, more willing than the ear. Fine counsel is confusing, but example is always clear. And the best of all the preachers are the men who live their creeds. For to see a good put in action is what everybody needs. Now, do you agree with that? I do. It's basically saying if you don't walk the walk, there's no, 
there's basically no one's going to listen when you try to talk the talk. Okay? That's basically what it's saying. But too many people just quote the first line of the poet. I, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one. Well, who wouldn't? Sermons kind of tend to go on and on. But that's not the way Jesus looks at it. The idea that I can get by with just doing my faith and not talking about it is hogwash. Did you know the term uh, hogwash is a biblical term? It's a biblical term. <laughs> Trying to get by with keeping my faith to myself is a cheap way out. That's not how Jesus intended his church to be built. You know what an atheist once told William Booth? William Booth was the founder of the Salvation Army. And this atheist told him, this is what he said, quote, If I believe what you Christians say you believe about a coming judgment and the impenitent rejectors of Christ will be lost, this atheist said, I would crawl on my bare knees on crushed glass all over London, warning men night and day to plead for refuge for the coming day of wrath. Think about that. Are we crawling on our knees in crushed glass trying to warn our families and those we love, our neighbors, the people we work with? question is, if we're not, is it because we don't believe? Something to take home and think about. So one of the questions for us today is this. Do you believe what you say you believe? Do you believe what you say you believe? A man once told a preacher, I don't wear my religion on my sleeves. My religion is personal and I don't want to talk about it. Preachers was startled for a moment and he asked him, You are a Christian, aren't you? He said, Yes, but I'm not a religious fanatic. Preacher gently said, Did it ever occur to you the cost? That Jesus Christ gave in sacrificing his own life so that you could call yourself a Christian. It cost the disciples their lives too. And millions of Christians throughout the centuries have suffered or died as martyrs in order to get the message of God's love and forgiveness to you. Now, do you really believe that your faith in Christ is personal and private and that you should not talk about it? The man bowed his head and he replied, No, sir, you're right. Tell me what I can do about it. So another question for us today is this. Do you realize how much blood has been shed so you could be saved? How much blood has been shed? Jesus planned to build his church through faithful Christians who were willing to talk about their faith. Remember we talked about that in the first message? About plan A, plan B, what's plan B if plan A don't work? And what did Jesus say? I have no plan B. Plan A is my those that follow me will continue this. That's plan A. That's the only plan. And I'm not, I don't have a plan B. Well, how do we feel about that? What does Romans chapter 10 verse 14 tell us? It says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not? What's the next word? Heard. Heard. And how shall they hear without a preacher? That someone who should be preaching to the lost is not just this preacher in this pulpit right now. That someone who should be preaching to the lost is you. Each of you. And it's me. 
The Bible tells us that when we decide to share our faith, God gets really excited about it. What does verse 15 declare? Romans 10, 15. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. He calls our feet pretty. Wives, how many of, of your husbands ever talk about how beautiful your feet are? If they are beautiful, right? But if we're taking our feet out to declare the good news, what we did yesterday, going out and ministering to the homeless and praying for them, he looks and says, how beautiful are your feet? Because you're carrying the gospel. He gets excited about it. What is it that we need to share? What do you need to share? Do you need to go out there and give some big theological speech about certain things in the Bible? No. What we share with other people is that we were sinners and we decided to turn it all over to Jesus. We believed, we repented, we got baptized, and now we are saved by grace. We try to live a good life, but it's Jesus that guarantees us heaven. Our good deeds can't buy God's grace, but we do the good deeds now because God gave His gift freely. He's taken our guilt away. And now we can approach others with the same message. You have sinned, and you need to repent, and you need to turn to Jesus so you can experience the times of peace and refreshment. That's what we share. That's really the gospel summed up in a nutshell. And that's what we share. Now let me be perfectly clear here. Just because Jesus wants you to share your faith does not mean that people you talk to are going to be all excited about what you're saying. What happened in Acts chapter 4, 18 to 20? What's it say? So they, the Sanhedrin, called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. But we, we cannot. We cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. In other words, the Sanhedrin told them to shut up about Jesus, quit talking about Him, stop sharing your faith, cut it out. But Peter and John said, Sorry, that's not going to happen. We believe and we love Jesus and we're not going to stop talking about Him. Some I encounter may be uncomfortable having me around. They, they may complain that all I ever talk about is my family and Jesus. My wife, my kids, and Jesus. Well, duh. Duh. I'm a husband. I'm a parent. I'm a preacher. What else am I you expect me to talk about? Right? Now, why do I talk about my wife and my kids? Because I love them. And I tend to build my life around them. It's the same with why I talk so much about Jesus. I love them. I, I, I build my life around them as well. And for the Christian, that's a driving force. When we love Jesus, when we realize what might have happened to us if Jesus had not died for us, what on earth could we ever want to talk about that would be nearly as important? Nothing. How many of you are on Facebook? Have you ever noticed how much people share these little cute little doggies or something political? You know, there's all, all that's all you see now. It's something little cute or something political. And I used to be a lot more vocal about them, especially politics. But I had a come to Jesus moment, and I'm not as much now. You know why? Because I realized 
that my political commentary was putting Jesus in the shadows. And that it is not what I want to do. I don't want to distract folks from the real love of my life. Who is that? Jesus. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 2. For I am determined not to know anything among you. Except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul didn't want to know your gossip. He didn't want to know your problems. He didn't want to know your weaknesses. He didn't want to know anything but that you believed that Jesus died, rose again, and that you believed you had been forgiven of your sins. Because that means you're, you're one of me. You're part of my brotherhood. You're part of who we're a part of. I don't want to know all the other ugly details. I want to know where you stand in your faith. That's what Paul was saying. And that's really how we should be. You know, they may not know what your political side is, but they sure know who your religious side is. And that's where we put all our emphasis at. Here's the deal. The driving force in talking about Jesus must be how much we care about whether or not the people we witness to go to hell. There's people that you break bread with every day at work. There's people every day that you're around. People, members of your own family that you're around. And it's just a, a really mind-grabbing thing to think about. The very people that we love may not make it. And this something in us that could have prevented that. And we were afraid to do it. Do you want the people you love to go to hell? You and I should be driven by the concerns that our friends, relatives, fellow workers, neighbors, that they all that we should be concerned that they very well may go to hell if we don't tell them about Jesus. If we don't care about that, we have nothing really to share. If you really love somebody, you want them to live with you. Someone once noted, listen to this. If there was a fire in your house, and, and you had six family members inside, how many would you have to get out before you were satisfied? How many? All six. All six of them, right? Well, how many would you take? One or two? Or all of them? All of them. In fact, the fire department would probably have to wrestle you to the ground to keep you from going in one last time to rescue whoever was left, right? I want to close with this true story. A man named Dave Hastings, you can look this up on the internet. He has a ministry in, in Kentucky. He told of sitting on the front porch with his friend Mike. Dave was in junior high years and they were just goofing off. And for some reason they started talking about death. And Dave jokingly asked Mike what he would do if he, Dave, died. What's going to happen to me if I die? Dave said, I can remember it like it was yesterday when my buddy Mike said to me, it would break my heart because you died without Jesus. That one sentence was the catalyst of what changed Dave's life. And now he has a big ministry in Kentucky. He's about probably my age or maybe a year or two older than me now.
Think about what we just read. Peter stood before the Sanhedrin. He could have been on the spot martyred for what he was doing. And he told those people what they needed to hear. In fact, they even ordered him not to say any more. And with that boldness, he said, no, if you want to be in my presence, you're going to hear what I have to say. I'm not going to stop. Now, some people will say, well, that's radical. That's stupid. That's what, why are you bugging people? If your house was on fire and you were in your room asleep and someone kept banging on the door to wake you up, would you consider that they were bugging you? No, they're trying to save your life. We're not bugging people. We love them. And that's why we continue to talk to them about Jesus. That's the whole point of this. The ultimate thing is, if, if these individuals do not accept Jesus and turn to Jesus, what's their destination? They go to hell. Everyone has that choice to make. Now just because we preach to someone doesn't mean they're automatically going to heaven either. Because what do they have to do? Accept Jesus. Turn to Jesus. And that's why every day in our prayers, that should be the focal point of some of the things we pray for. The salvation of those we love. It takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of boldness. But you know what? We can do it if we let the Holy Spirit direct us. I think the reason why Peter could have his boldness and say what he said and do it so eloquently in the way he said it. What did it say? He was under the Holy Spirit. Seek the Holy Spirit to help you know what to say, when to say it, how to say it. What's the best time to say it? Let the Holy Spirit control how you do this. And then that way you can spend eternity with those that you love. Our Father in heaven, we thank you. We thank you so much for this day. We thank you for our worship. We pray, Father, that we will have the boldness and that we will be receptive to the Holy Spirit as it teaches us and shows us the things that we need. The things, the right things to say and how to say it. Father, I pray for every person here who has a mate, has a child, has a parent, has a cousin, has a workmate, has a best friend. Somebody out there that they care about, that, they're, that, 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 that they really, really have a, an affection for. And Father, I'm praying right now that you will give them boldness and courage to speak to them about their faith. To speak to them, to give their testimony and how you and Jesus, Holy Spirit, has come into their lives and changed things and made things better and, and built them a foundation. And, and, and now they have a hope to rest on. Father, give these ones the encouragement and the boldness that they need to keep pressing and to keep going forward and witnessing to those that they love. Yes, the Bible says that a prophet is not honored in his own territory. And many times, Father, in our own homes, our families will scoff at us when we try to preach. But despite the ridicule, despite whatever apathy we may receive, Father, still give us the encouragement out of love to continue. Jesus is the primary thing in our life. He picked us up. He took us along the way. He got us out of the pit of hell. 
He, he gave us the foundation we needed. Yes, Jesus came into our lives and changed us, Father. He took the addictions away. He took the pain away. He took the guilt away. He took the shame away. He took these things away. And now we stand before you with peace, with no guilt, no shame, knowing that we have a testimony. Give us what we need, Father, to speak our testimony and to bring people to the feet of Jesus. He saved us for a purpose. He saved us for a reason. Help us to live in that reason and to be the light that shines in a dark world. Bless us, Father. Continue to bless this church for the souls that are desperate. For the souls that have come. Father, I pray that you keep us broken. It's when we're broken that we can be used the most by you. Because we're not relying on our own ability. We're not relying on what we have. But we're relying on what you are giving us each and every day. Keep us broken. Keep us faithful. Keep us in your love. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We give you the honor, the praise. We render up all these thanksgivings. And we stand here completely devoted to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.